But we're going to be looking at learning outcome two today, which is understand the development of systems that promote diversity, equality, and inclusion. Now, there's a two learning, uh, there's two assessment criteria for here. So 2.1 is evaluate the effectiveness of policies in ensuring legislatory requirements are met. And then 2.2 is evaluate the effectiveness of procedures in promoting equality, diversity, and inclusion in the workplace. So if I scroll down to the indicative content, it just I've gone over some of these points in here, looked at policies and procedures, looked at anti-discriminatory and non-judgmental attitudes and practices, how to do good role modeling, training, supervision, and so on. So the PowerPoint that you're going to be looking at will be following uh, this content here. Go. Okay. Lots are. Yeah, it's quite simple actually. This one, to be honest, you're quite um, informed about equality and diversity anyway, which is which always helps. But this unit in itself is just it's quite self-explanatory, isn't it? Really, you've got uh, all the things you really know about on a daily basis, and then you're just adding in legislations or a few offshoots into it. So well, I, I was thinking. So, mm -hmm. You know, you know, when you were speaking yesterday, like yeah. when, when when you finished, like I, I always like reevaluate what was said. Yeah. And I'll meditate and I'll I'll just think back and I'll think of what's been said and what I've said and you know, uh, and my brain just starts to wander off in different directions. And I was mm -hmm. thinking that you know, when it comes to equality and diversity. The reason equality and diversity is the way that it is, is because people can't see beyond the outer of what the person's actually displaying. They don't yeah. see the inside of the person. And it's because of the outside. And that's why people don't want to give people a chance because they might have a disability. So they're looking at the physical rather than yeah. what's inside. It's, it's, but if you look beyond what the eye can see, then, you know, it may be No, exactly. Better. And it, it just, it boils down to you getting to know someone and not just judging them because of looks or what your own preconceived notions are. So it, it doesn't matter yeah. about what you think. It's really just give people a chance and then let them prove themselves. That's what it's all about, really. So we've got 2.1 is evaluate the effectiveness of policies in ensuring legislatory requirements are met. So on here. So we're just going to look at policies and procedures and how they're actually really important to make sure that um, everybody within the setting is doing the same things. So you don't want somebody doing a procedure in a different way compared to somebody else doing it in a different way. You want to have a set of rules that everybody can follow and they're confident about following so that it covers your own backs, it covers the organisation. And also, it helps you to give the same type of care to everyone. Plus, it'll give you confidence more if you know exactly what you're doing. Like, say, I'm, I do a particular task in a particular way. You do the same way. Everybody follows the same rules. Yeah. So, policies and procedures, just standardize the way you do things, so your operational activities in a consistent way. It helps you to possibly speed up your processes. It helps you to get good practice, and then it also helps you to not make as many mistakes as you would if you're just going on about yourself. And then it can keep you safe and it keep your patients safe. For example, if something wrong happened and you were following the policies and procedures and it, a patient was to be harmed, you're covered saying that I have followed the policies and procedures exactly the way they're meant to be. So it covers your own back. And also it'll help you not you know, do considerable harm to patients as well, because you know you're doing a tried and tested um, procedure. So these policies and procedures, they're actually crucial everywhere, but especially in healthcare, because in healthcare, you've got um, an industry that is very familiar with crisis. You've got a lot of liability risks. So you need to have these policies in place and Everybody needs to actually be familiar with these policies to make sure that they know that they're not um, putting people at risk or even themselves at risk. Now, these procedures that are within the policies, they just outline the way that you're meant to do certain things 
or if a problem has occurred, how you should go about trying to fix it or who you should contact. So you actually know exactly who to go to, which way, which is the chain of command, who can help you and what can you do if something does ever happen. Now, the policies and procedures, they actually help you to create an optimal environment. So like I said earlier, everybody's following the same rules. They're doing the same sort of procedures. They're treating everybody in a, in a set way. So it gives you a nice basis. It helps you to create compliance and, again, a uniformity of service. And, again, it's helping you to adopt anti-discriminatory and non-judgmental attitudes. Because like you said, there are times, unfortunately, when somebody will look at you and instantly judge you, maybe for your accent or the way you're dressed or the way you look or your colour of your skin. Unfortunately, that does happen. But in this way, you know you're following a set of procedures that you know, you have to behave in a certain way, you have to converse in a certain way, and it does help you. You know what I think it is? I, 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 I... I think it's the mindset of the, of the world, and I think people just want an easier life, and they they, they do that. They, they 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 base their life and what they can get out of life based on their own agendas. So okay. if there was a homeless guy, say, and a guy dressed in a suit, but the homeless guy was more equipped for the job than the person mm -hmm. that was in the suit, they give the person in the suit the job because yeah. the homeless guy. You, you, it's, it's like you say, it's that, it's that judgmental as well. It's that homeless, even though he's better equipped, he might rob something or he might do this or he might take mm -hmm. this or he might, you know what I mean? And it's, it's not always the case. And this is where I think the world goes wrong. It's because they set, they think instantly there's a set of risks here. Uh, we're going to have to support this person a lot more than this person. So it's just, yeah, like you're saying, people do like to say the easy route. And it also depends on, say, if you've grown up in a certain type of community and you've not seen people of other colours or other races or other thoughts and views, even that sometimes affects the way you think and the way you act. So it is, I mean, it's fantastic now that we live in a diverse um, community where we are able to access a lot of different people from different races and religions. So it, and schools are teaching this as well. So hopefully it will create a more diverse future with the children that are coming forward. Yeah, hopefully. So your policies are in place. So you've got some things like health and safety, equality and diversity, data protection. So all of these are in place to make sure that you're compliant, that you're following the same rules, that there's no risks available and that you're treating people in the way they deserve to be treated. You've got dress codes and codes of conduct. I know that when I was working in uh, schools, there were certain things that I was and was not allowed to wear. We weren't allowed to wear low cut uh, tops or shorts or trainers or jeans because we needed to convey ourselves in a certain manner. We're, we're role models. We're showing those students that are there that, um, you know, this is somebody that you need to look up to. So we had very strict um, policies in place for how we dressed and especially how we spoke to um, family members of our students as well. With that, we couldn't uh, exchange phone numbers with, the, um, say, if we had a student and a friend, we ended up striking up a friendship with one of their parents. You, you're not, there's certain things that you can't do. So these codes and conducts actually help you to know exactly what you are allowed to and are not allowed to do. Then you've got training and supervision practices. So this will help you to keep your knowledge up to date. So you might end up getting a mentor, somebody who's mentoring you and showing you the ropes. You might get a coach who just wants to come in and give you a couple of sessions on how to um, put in a drip or how to do palliative care for someone. They give you their skills and techniques. Or you might be put onto training courses or um, you know um, conferences that you can go and learn new knowledge. So within your workplace, it's always advisable that your workplace encourages equality, diversity and inclusion. And there's, by doing this, there's um, a couple of things that make it better. So it, it makes your workplace more successful. It keeps your employees more happy and motivated. It helps to prevent serious or legal issues. 
things like bullying, harassment and discrimination. So you know if you're getting bullied, if there's a certain staff member that is not behaving in the way that they're meant to behave with you, you know what your processes are and who you can go to and it needs to be and it will be dealt in the correct way. It helps you to better serve a diverse range of customers or patients or service users. It helps you to get new ideas and problem solving because you're all, if you know that it's a place where you're at where your thoughts and your input is welcomed, you might have a really fantastic idea and you might want to put it out and you know that you're not going to get shot down and said, oh, be quiet, we don't want to listen from you. You're not in management or you're not in this position. Why should we listen to your idea? If you've got a nice workplace where you're encouraged to speak up and participate, you know you can give them more ideas. And again, if you're happy at work, you're going to advertise it to your friends. You're going to tell other people. Somebody that comes in for an interview, they're going to notice straight away if someone looks uh, happy or if someone looks a bit down. So it'll attract new staff, but it'll also keep your staff where they are. And then evidence, it shows that policies and procedures that promote equality and diversity um, need to be um, reviewed regularly so that you're keeping up to date with any changes in legislation or even any changes in the current political environment. And then, like managers, just as me as a teacher, when I was within a physical school setting, you need to act as a role model. You need to be there, dress in a certain way, speak in a certain way, you know, be friendly with your staff. But in the staff room, have a joke with them, talk to them about your evening, you know, have a bit of a laugh with them. But when you're on the floor, when you're working, keep it professional. Yeah, so it goes back to being informal and formal in communication. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's right. It all just sort of like goes in full circle, doesn't it, all of these? And then the last slide for here. Oh, dear. I've gone. We went on to 2.2 .2 without even me telling you it was 2.2. .2. I was that involved in it. So um, the, section that I just spoke to you about, <laughs> the section that I just spoke to you about uh, encouraging equality and diversity, that was 2.2. .2. So we were looking at evaluate the effectiveness of procedures in promoting quality, diversity and inclusion at work. So the points we just talked about being successful and make people happy is how to make a good workplace. and then. What you want to do is for equality and diversity, the policies and procedures, if they're set into place and if they're actually being followed, they'll help you to challenge discrimination. Because unfortunately, like you said, people can discriminate by realizing it and by not realizing it as well. So you might get somebody doing direct discrimination and saying, like you said, there's a person who's homeless who may be really qualified for the job, but they're not going to get it because of their, their appearance. Or maybe they've not got the best type of suit or the best uh, type of, uh, you know, a personal uh, appearance compared to somebody who's all, you know, shopped out in a brand new suit and haircut and all them. So that's direct discrimination. But then you can have indirect discrimination where, for example, if um, there's a certain policy that's employed within uh, your workplace saying that you can't wear jewellery. It might um, impact Christians or Catholics that like to wear a, a cross or there might be a rule saying that everybody has to work uh, at least two Saturdays a month. But for uh, some Jewish people, Saturday is a, a holy day. So it, you're indirectly discriminating in that way. So unfortunately, they, it can happen in many ways. Sometimes you realise it and sometimes you don't. So there's lots of effects of discrimination. So there's physical, emotional, social, and intellectual. So physical effects, you can start giving a person signs of poor health. They might be getting bullied and abused. They might regress into themselves or just be quite, um, you know, antsy and scared to do certain tasks, worrying that there's somebody that's going to bully them or say not very nice things to them. 
emotional effects. Again, you might be withdrawn. You might decide to exclude yourself. So you might have been really um, outgoing to start off with, but because you're not getting promoted in the way you should be or included in the way you should, you're withdrawing into yourself. So you're becoming quiet. You might become emotionally fragile. The social... Yeah. Well, wouldn't that fall under the category that you, you, you've not actually got, got the job for, for the purpose of what the job is? Because if you've only got the job just to gain a status or just to gain to where, again, it comes down to that person's own agenda. If you say so it's health and social care and you've only got yeah. the job just to, to, I don't know, be in that management role because it pays more money, then you're yeah. not in the right job because you need to... Health and social care, yeah, you, you have to have eyes for people. So when you have eyes for people, that means you, you look into the heart and you've got a heart yourself and you look after that person, you'll spend time, even if you don't really get on with that person or you have different views or opinions from that person. It doesn't mean that they're a human being just like we all are. And exactly. We spend time with people in order to care for them and help them so they can live the best life possible. Because even within healthcare, you've got it's even in their own settings that it says that you need to be caring and compassionate and considerate. So if you're not any of those things, you're not really in the right environment. I mean, there are a lot of people that go into management to get the experience and then they jump into a different company or they just want it there so they know that whenever they apply for something in the future, that they know they've got a management role to back up on. So it helps them progress. So it's obviously it's not the best thing to be doing if you're if you don't have caring compassion if you're not a people person if you know there's there's no point it's 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 going to be extremely difficult for you to adopt all these ideals that are meant to be within health and social care so yeah you are right people do need to be coming into the industry you know with the right mind and the right thoughts not just it's a lot of money I'm going to make so much out of this. You might end up being miserable and making everybody else miserable around you as well. So it will go into that, yeah. You've um again you've got social effects as well. So you might have a lack of friends, you might be excluded, you might feel left out. You know, when you're in high school and there's a popular set of kids or there's groups of kids that um you might have had a falling out with someone, so you have an offshoot and you make your own little groups. Sometimes you might end up being left out and or you might have had a best friend that's you know, decided not to be your friend again. You know, so everybody knows a feeling of exclusion and how it feels to be left out, and it's not a nice feeling. So these are some social issues that can happen. Intellectually, you might decide not to participate in anything, and you might be disinterested. So that, again, has a knock-on effect. So if you're not participating, if you're disinterested, no one's going to take an interest in you. They're going to be like, that, that person's not bothered. Why should I bother with them? So it really is like a, a vicious circle that uh, goes round. So the point of these policies and these procedures are that they're set in place to help you to identify these areas and also to challenge them when it's needed so that you know that this person is showing signs of uh, physical effects or emotionally they become withdrawn. You'll be familiar with that person. You'll have worked with them for a while. So you'll know how to identify it and hopefully challenge it. Because as you were saying uh, a couple of weeks ago, you were talking about a young man who um, has issues um, looking after himself personally. He'll listen to you because you're just quite a matter of fact and you'll give him like rewards and things and say, we'll take a photo of you, we'll do this. But other people might be quite um, abrupt with him and he won't respond in that way. So. You've got to know that young man and you know what responds with him. But other people, if they don't get to know him, they're not going to get any results out of him, are they? I think sometimes you have to, as, as, as like a worker, like obviously, you know, I, I'm classed as a senior resident in, in the rehab that I'm living in. Yes. Um, so I take people out and people are coming with a lot of baggage, you know. People have come yeah. from, obviously, we're all from different backgrounds. We've all been through and seen different things. You know, but sometimes you, you have to stoop down to that person's level 
Um, mm-hmm. And what, what I mean by that is, you know, you, you might be able to rebuke somebody and they might have thick skin, but then if you rebuke somebody else in the same way, they might yeah. not be able to take it. As, so then you have to do it in a specific way where you're still mm-hmm. going to keep the peace but get your point across. So I think you just mm-hmm. have to sometimes, when you speak to people and the people that, that, that you see, especially in like a health and social care setting, Mm-hmm. You, you have to be aware of like the emotional state and you know the personality of that person that you know you, you're not going to cause trouble or you're not going to offend somebody by what you say but still get exactly. the point across based on you know what you know of them so you're adapting your own approach and it's what we call uh, you're differentiating so you're you might be speaking to somebody in a different way you're adapting you know speaking to them like you can speak to them a matter of fact but with another person, you know that you've got to know them and you know that I can't speak harshly. I've got to be a bit more loving with them, a bit more coaxing with them. So, yeah, it's exactly. Yeah. I mean, you've got you've got it right down to the point. And that's exactly adapting your technique, speaking to people in the way they need to be spoken to. It, it's just that, that's the exact way that it needs to happen. It's all about you getting you, you taking the time to know someone. I mean, that's what shows what a, a good um uh, employee within healthcare is if you take the time you get to know someone and then you approach your own self in that way so you're not worried about changing yourself to you know make sure that the results are met it's like you just said though then it's a test for us as well you know because mm-hmm. you you look at yourself and you think you know what no i'm actually i've, I've actually learned something here as well know maybe i can be about outspoken or maybe can, you know maybe i just bought in or whatever maybe yeah. i need to stop but you you know what i mean you, you start to learn things yourself as well so it's, it's not just it's, it's, it's about them but then you start looking at yourself as well and think you know what you know I, i've been doing this all this time and then you know i'm actually going about this the wrong way maybe i yeah. need to be more patient or maybe i need to listen more or <laughs> you know what i mean so I mean, that's part of life as well, though, isn't it? I mean, you're constantly evolving yourself. You're constantly adapting yourself, trying to, you know, what you were saying earlier is after the lesson, you'll sit down and meditate. That's what we call as reflecting. So whenever I've done a a teaching, whenever I've done a lesson or whenever some things will go good, some things will go bad in whatever aspect of life. I'll, I'll, you know, you end up thinking back on it. You end up reflecting, and you think, "Oh, this was good. Maybe I'll put, th- I'll do this again next time." Or that was terrible. I shouldn't have spoken to someone that way, or I shouldn't have said this, or I shouldn't have done that. And it helps you to evolve yourself, you know, into um, you're constantly changing and adapting. So when we look at inclusion, we're going to look at the impact of inclusion. So these are the good things. So it gives you an increased employee engagement. You're happy to work. You've got higher engagement and retention. So people that are working within your setting, they're um, more involved and they actually want to stay. You've got good mental health. You've got good morale. With the good mental health, if you know there's some, there's a manager or there's a particular person that you can go to and you can vent to and you can tell them that I've got this problem with that and they actually listen to you, that is really beneficial. You've got improved performances. It helps you to challenge discrimination. It helps your staff to be happy and confident. And again, it helps you to have opportunities for training. So you might know a particular skill. You might have, like you're coming on this course now. You might want somebody else might be interested or, you know, you might have some information that somebody else doesn't know about and you can tell them that I learned this today and you're passing on your knowledge to someone else. And we're going to talk about the value of diversity and celebrating it. So it helps to overcome stereotypes. But when we do celebrate our differences and that we're open to diversity, we know that our, like you said earlier, we have preconceived notions. We've got certain set of ideas in our head and we don't like to be proven wrong, but mostly we can be proven wrong because they're not fixed. Things change. Diversity also helps you to build cultural awareness. So we normally tend to surround ourselves with, you know, with people that are like us. We live in a certain community where there's people that are familiar to you. You end up uh, being with like-minded people around you. But when you're surrounding yourself with a broad range of people, 
it helps you to understand different learnings and different techniques, different people, what their thoughts and values are. I mean, there's certain things that I do that um, when um, I maybe my work, uh, my colleagues may or may not agree with, and there's certain things that they do that I may or may not agree with. But that doesn't mean that we're going to uh, chastise each other or put each other down. It's you have different celebrations, you have different occasions, different types of cultures that you celebrate. So it's nice to just, you know, welcome someone and even just give them a, a Merry Christmas or a Happy Easter or Eid Mubarak, any of those things. It's nice to acknowledge other people. It also discourages racism. So racism, we I believe, it is, comes out of fear and ignorance, especially if you've been in an environment where you're not being in a diverse culture or in a diverse um, community. You, you end up seeing everybody that is similar to you, and you don't know what differences are. You might not have seen a certain colour of person before or a certain ethnicity of person before. And it's... it's it's different, it's confusing for you, it can be frustrating not understanding things. So when we celebrate diversity, it helps to overcome racism. So, I mean, diversity is celebrated within very early on in primary schools as well now. Every single celebration will be celebrated. You might make a Christmas card, but then you might also make a Diwali card. You'll come in dressed in traditional clothes and encourage people to bring in separate like little parties and things. So it really helps everyone to understand at an early age that we might be different, but this is a celebration we can all enjoy together. Yeah. It also encourages unity. So in that emotion where we've got we're all in this together. So rather than seeing our differences. Um, that are something that you know keep us apart. We try and celebrate them and um, let them unite us. Especially now, since all this COVID nineteen um, issues have gone down, I mean, it's um, I think people are more unified now, thinking that uh, we do need to protect each other. We need to be feasible and keep distances. You know, where that's wear a mask. You might be uncomfortable wearing a mask, but um, you'll get used to it. Unless, of course, you've got a health issue, but so it helps you to unite together as well. And now we've come on to the person-centered way of working. So person-centered care is very big in healthcare. So I'm pretty sure you'll have heard of it before. It's where it encourages you to, you know, uh, be considerate and compassionate, to look at people and include them and look at their differences but also have that includes equality and diversity as well. It's very big with person-centred care. Also, person-centred care actually helps you to make choices about um, what care you're getting given. So I know when I was younger, I'd go to the doctors with my parents or anything, and we'd get told that, oh, Asha needs this medication, or she needs this, that, and the other, and we'd blindly follow it. But now you'd... You'd go in, you'd, if somebody would, the doctor would say, you need this medication. You've got the right to say, what is this medication actually for? What am I doing? What is the, um, you might have, I know in my previous, uh, in my younger days, I, we probably get given medication without even knowing what we're taking it for. But now you've got the right to question and find out, you know, exactly what it is that you've got. And then you can make suggestions and say, I'm not very really good at taking pills. Is there a liquid form or is there something else that I can do? So it helps you to be in the centre of your care and the centre of what decisions are being made for you. So person-centred care, like I said, it helps you value compassion, dignity and respect. So we've got a couple of points on here for person-centred care. It um, helps you to support people's independence. It honours people's choices. It improves the quality of life. It empowers residents. It enhances dignity and promotes um, positive well-being. So person-centred care is a fantastic um, implementation that has been carried out for here. So overall, just as a recap, we've looked at the different policies 
and how uh, they can um, make sure that um, your requirements are met. So we looked at anti-discrimination, code of conduct, dress codes, and so on. Then we looked at the effectiveness of uh, procedures to promote equality, diversity. So person-centered ways, we looked at in the effects of inclusion and the effects of discrimination on here. Uh, do you have any questions, Lee? Like no, uh, <laughs> uh, no, I've, I've, I've asked, uh, I, I bought in, I shouldn't, I shouldn't do that, you know, I'm sorry. Oh, no, do you know what, Lee, I actually enjoy the fact that you comment in between. I don't like hearing my voice only. I like the fact that we're quite interactive on this. So when you give me, you know, it shows me that you're understanding and it shows me your viewpoint. So never apologize for, uh, you know, talking because that's what we're here for. So don't apologize for that. I know. I'm going to turn the recording off.